I don't think I know any mom who hasn't had to deal with mom guilt. When I met today's guest at a conference back in August, and she said that her area of focus was mom guilt, I knew I wanted to have her on to chat with us. Joanne Crone is the founder of No Guilt Mom. She is a parenting coach who helps moms create a solid relationship with their kids, as well as prioritize their own needs. Today, we are discussing all things mom guilt and mental load, and Joanne is sharing some tips for how to ditch that guilty feeling. Hi, I'm Allison Edgity, a pediatric sleep and wellness coach and a mom of two. I love to help parents find solutions. This is How Long Till Bedtime. Well, hi, Joanne. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm so glad that our paths crossed over the summer, and I'm looking forward to having you share some of your wisdom all about ditching mom guilt. Thank you for having me. Yeah, excited to chat today. And the first question I always like to ask my guests is, what inspired you to pursue your vocation and to start your business? Oh, okay. This is a great question because I have had many professions in my life. I started out in the entertainment industry in Los Angeles, working like behind the scenes in development and production. And then I was an elementary school teacher. So this is the third career I've had, but I've had it for the past, oh, almost 11 years now. So it's sticking for sure. Um, And I started it when I took off after my second child was born, my son, from teaching. I'd meant to only take off for a year and then come back in the classroom. But during that year, what I discovered when I was staying home with him was that first that it was really lonely being a stay-at-home mom with a kid. Really lonely. Like I, I was itching to get out of the house. And I was looking all around my city for these fun things to do. And I specifically wanted to tell other moms with babies because I feel like with the kid activities, it was more geared toward, you know, preschoolers and kids who can actually interact, not that just were laying there like my son was at the time. Um, and I wanted to give other moms this opportunity to be like, oh, I could go here with my baby or I could go here with my baby and I could see other moms hanging out and we could do this. So that's how I started um, my company. And since then, it has morphed into just like after seeing the need out there from people, seeing the mom guilt that exists with every child decision we have, seeing all of the women who never put themselves first because they're always really concerned about how their kids are doing or how their partner is doing and never wanting to make anyone else unhappy by being quote unquote selfish. And this also comes from my own mom. Like no guilt mom is really me trying to tell my own mom that it's okay to spend time on yourself. It's okay to pursue your own things. Like you don't have to be totally focused on the kids all the time. Like Be focused on you and what makes you happy. And so a lot of my company and what I work for is really stemming from what I saw my mom do in my childhood and how I'm still convincing her to this day, she's like in her early 70s, to do things on her own and to take time for herself. Uh, And that's, that's how it all got started. Oh, I love that. So I love that this is Joanne 3.0 because I'm also (laughs) on Allison 3.0 on the career front. So that's what I would say. Sleep coach Allison 3.0. I love it. Um, And I so relate to what you're saying about your mom because I always tell my clients that your mom also is still dealing with mom guilt. So when they say, I'm having a really hard time getting them my mom to stick to the plan because there's so many grandparents helping with childcare at this point. I believe it's up to 60%. Yeah. And so when we, I, my parents do with my nephew. Amazing. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's really making a comeback, I would say. But then I have a lot of clients who deal with the like, oh, my mom's not following the plan or she's judging me. And I always say, I don't think so. I think she's feeling judged. 
because it's different mm-hmm. from what she did. And yeah, even as a grandparent, I think they are still navigating mom guilt. And I see it in my mom as well around every holiday. Did you have fun? Mm-hmm. Do you like the gift I gave you? I'm like, mom, come on. <laughs> Let it go. Yeah. I see it all the time, especially with my mom. Like, I hope my mom is okay with me saying this one, but um, she's wanted to go on a beach vacation for the longest time. And my dad, like, wants to go back to Pennsylvania where he was born and see, like, that area. Well, uh, my friend's a travel agent, and so I contacted my friend, and we put together this list of options for my mom. Uh, And there were great options. My dad said one thing. He's like, well, let's go on this beach vacation so then we could go to Pennsylvania. Like, he said it just off the cuff. Like, oh, my gosh, that started the war. And my mom has completely given up her beach vacation because she does not want my dad to feel unhappy or to, like, have to do something out of his way so that she could go on the beach vacation. And I'm like, mom! But also... I have to step back and I'm like, this is my mom's life. I cannot control her. I am just going to create more conflict in our relationship if I keep pushing on that. When she is ready, she will be ready. That's so true. So true. Mm -hmm. Well, we've already kind of dove right into things, but let's take (laughs) a step back for a second on the mom guilt front because I think every mom's version of mom guilt is going to look different of what is stressing us out. So when you think about the moms that you're working with, what do you see as their biggest pain points as it relates to mom guilt? It's all the stuff to do. It's the constant overwhelm and barrage of expectations and requests being made of them. Whether it is like trying to make sure that their kids are enrolled in a specific school program or keeping on top of their kids for homework, uh, meshed with all of that emotional labor responsibility. So like if the kids are fighting and their sibling rivalry or if one kid is experiencing anxiety, how do I help that child? Versus like if one kid is like stuck in their room and they won't come out and they won't talk, like how do I help that child? And then managing the mental load of running a home without the communication there to get their partner support if they have a partner at home. So she's here doing absolutely everything to help her family succeed, to help her family thrive and stay afloat and while managing everything at home. And because of that amount that's on her, she feels like she's failing all the time, which I think is very, very common for most women today. We just feel like we're failing all the time. Yeah. And while I think we've already talked about our moms experienced mom guilt and maybe still are. But I think our generation is feeling it more intensely. And I suspect that part of that is due to social media and us seeing the highlight reels of other moms' lives and their children's lives. And we can start to feel guilty about not doing all of those things or that comparison trap. So what are your thoughts on social media's role into mom guilt? I think that social media gets a really bad rap for it because we like when we were growing up too and our moms, our moms had like the magazines to look at, like those gorgeous magazine spreads that aren't unlike social media. I mean, social media, we do get a barrage of it. Like we get more fed to us every single day, but those images still existed. What is really not talked about, and this was brought to my attention in the book Burnout by Emily and Amelia Nagoski. Have you read this book? I have not. So the book is so great because it tells you that women have really been given the short end of the stick here where we have been told, oh, you just need to manage your time better. Oh, you just have to stick to boundaries. Oh, you just have to do this and that. And women are doing that. Like we are doing all the things. But what isn't being mentioned is all of the societal pressures that we have against us that are really going against us so much so that it's almost like we're being gaslighted 
gaslit, really, I guess. That would be the past tense term. <laughs> but, but gaslit and saying like, oh, no, you're the issue. But really, we have this bigger issue over here. I mean, a report just came out on CNN um, the other day that millennial women are facing the biggest decline in mental health and overall well-being since the silent generation. And the silent generation were those who were born during the wars. And they're seeing a decline in first health care. The suicide rate among millennial women is up, as well as the homicide rate among millennial women are up as well. So like we have all of these things that are just in decline or they're in stagnation. So like education levels are stagnated since like 2017. They actually began going down in comparison to our mom's generation. Mm. So those are startling as well. And what we're not all talking about is something that the Barbie movie really brought to light. Have you seen the Barbie movie? I have. It's the patriarchy, ugh, as they say in the burnout book. <laughs> Every time they mention the word patriarchy, it's like, ugh. And it's really this system that is put in place in our society that doesn't really give women the leg up. It's telling us all the things we're doing wrong but then not providing us with the equal pay we need nor providing us with the health care nor providing us with the child care and support it's putting all of that on us and then we wonder why we're feeling the failure and the guilt because we're given this impossible task to overcome and we feel like we're the ones doing everything wrong when it's not us it's actually outside of us and I just think the mental load is increasing by the year. I mean, mm -hmm. we have to navigate our kids' screen time and when they're going to be on social media and how are we going to you know, protect them from all the evil that is online. And then when I was a kid and I was a what I would have considered a very serious athlete as a child. But when I was a little kid, it was like soccer practice once a week, a game once a week. Oh, your basketball season, one practice a week and a game. Otherwise, you were just out playing with your friends. And now I have a daughter who in the fall is 10, joined travel soccer, which I thought was two days of practice a week and games on the weekends, granted both days. But suddenly by the end, it had morphed into, well, we have our eye on her and, and we're going to do four practices a week. And I was like, we are legit doing six days of organized soccer for this one child uh, in our household. And it's things that I would have laughed at even five years ago. Like, I will never be that mom. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm judging people until I get that to that moment. And then I'm like, oh, hello, here I am. And so I just think also the... On top of everything you said, it's like the mental load is just getting heavier and heavier. And in my house, I have a, my husband's great. He does do a lot more, as my friends will say, a lot more than a lot of the husbands. You're so lucky. Do you get I'm that too? I'm so lucky. He does so much. Oh, and he lets me go on girls trips. Oh, yeah. They're like, it's so great no. to watch your kids. I'm like, he's not babysitting. They're his kids He's not now. babysitting. No. Yes. Yeah, I get, I get, I get on that. I have lots of Even with one. that, <laughs> I have to tell him when he says like, "You seem really stressed." I will sometimes write out a list, and I will say, "I just want to give you an idea of my mental load," and it's every activity, every outfit. My kids have a holiday concert tonight. He didn't think about their outfits. It's like every little thing. And so when I show him the list and I say, "This is my mental load," and this is why I'm a bit of a hot mess right now, he's like, "Oh wow, yeah." That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. It's gone crazy. And like you're not imagining it, that it has gone absolutely crazy because it has. And there is so much going on behind the scenes, too. The reason that it's crazy, like you mentioned, the soccer practices and all of that, because I mean, like when you're looking at kids from a young age and you have all of these things that you have to do with them per week and it's so that they can have this like professional goal or this like huge thing specializing really really young has been common instead of like in our generation where it's like we're gonna try a little bit of this and we're gonna try a little bit of this and we're gonna try a little bit this like you almost have to be like no we're going this we're doing it hardcore and you're gonna get a college scholarship and that's going to pay your way through school because 
that's what our society has almost become. I mean, for moms, if you now heard about like college entrance rates and college admission rates, like it is much tougher to get into college these days than it was for us. Like the admission rates have gone down where maybe it was like, I don't know, like 90% of the applications were admitted. It's like 10% now, which is insane. So you're doing all of this little stuff to try to stand out and to try to get your kids to that next level so that they'll be successful and they'll be thrive, but it's at the expense of our own mental health and at the expense of like our well-being as a family and our calmness and everything. So the world is kind of crazy around us, but that's not to make anyone feel bad. It's just to make people realize that like the game is rigged. And when we realize that the game is rigged, we can step back and be like, well, that's not fair. Now, what can I do against it? And it becomes less about us failing and more about us being like, no, we're set up against the system that is unjust. And now like the depression and the anxiety leaves us a little bit and we're able to take action and actually go forward with that information. Yeah. And in Allison 2.0, I worked <laughs> in at a university and not in admissions, but in fundraising. And so I got to hear from a lot of alumni who were frustrated about admissions and their children not getting in. And I was there for a little over nine years. And I think my biggest takeaway was they would be so distraught, actually mothers and fathers, but a lot of mothers, you could tell, took it so personally. They had done um, so much for this child and this child had accomplished so much. I mean, these yeah. were qualified candidates, which is always what I would say. Like, yes, your child is totally qualified. And what I had been kind of guided into coaching them through, but also became so true is this is going to work out the way it should. And your child is going to be happy and they're going to be fine. And we would fast forward because I had ongoing relationships with these folks to when that child was finishing college. And I cannot think of one example where a parent didn't say, oh, they ended up loving wherever they went. And they had the best experience and occasionally we had kids who it was still their dream to come to UVA and they would transfer in and great but the very vast majority of time parents would say it totally shook out the way it should and I always said to myself I got to really keep that in mind going forward in my parenting journey is that a lot of times there well there will be disappointments that's life and that it's going to shake out the way it should and my kids are going to be fine for the most part, yeah, I think that like our kids will be fine. It, it's such a tricky scenario because usually us, like we have a certain amount of privilege, uh, both you and I, just the fact that we're home and we're doing podcasts, like we do have a certain amount of privilege. And usually with that privilege comes this ability that our kids are gonna be, are gonna be fine. Like we're gonna be able to pick them up if they fall. We're gonna be able to like lead them in a direction and help them get the resources that they need. Um, but it's been like, <laughs> with mom guilt in particular, it's almost like we need to achieve like the perfection or this higher like higher thing where our kids need to be doing the best and our, we need to give up everything to make sure that our kids do the best like I saw this in Dancing with the Stars which I'm a big fan of but um Johnny oh, I can't remember his last name he's an ice skater but he was in the competition and he was oh, talking Johnny about Weir Johnny Weir yes Johnny yes. Weir so he was talking about how his mom gave up everything for him to achieve this dream of being a figure skater, bringing him to 6 a.m. practices, bringing him to like, you know, all of the, like the outside tournaments or like the competitions. And I think this is a message that is really popular in our society where it's like mom gives up everything so kid achieves this higher dream we really don't hear stories about mom sets really good boundaries so that child is a responsible adult and fam like contributing family member like that's not news <laughs> but <laughs> that is the thing that's going to bring us the most well-being and happiness so we need to realize like okay well this is the message that's being given to us by the outside world but is this true? 
Like, is yeah. this true in our own lives? And it's usually it's not. It's just that little subset, like that little 1% who is that way while the rest of us are trying for something that won't even make us happy. And so if moms are listening and thinking, yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I'm nodding along, what is kind of the the first thing you tell a mom to kind of regain a little bit of control or to slap down that mom guilt? So the biggest thing that has helped the moms, especially the ones in our balance community, is this knowing that they're not alone in this because moms right now think that they are failing and that it is all their fault and it is not your fault there are so many other women exactly like you and being able to be in a place where you hear their stories and where you like recognize in their stories you as well like one of our balance members amy says when she came in she was just so overwhelmed she thought she was failing and the thing that really helped her at first was just knowing that there are other women out there who are coming in to support her who are not judging her who are going through the exact same struggles that she is and who also want to better themselves and who want to be better people and who want to gain control over how they react and their emotions and how they react with their kids because like knowing all this and knowing that other people are going through it that's really the first step but the second step is also we want to have that relationship with our kids we want to be in their lives for the rest of their lives like it doesn't just end when they're 18 years old and they move out of the house we want this supportive relationship with them we want this supportive relationship with our partners and so after we know we're not alone then we can all work together to really figure out okay how can I work on myself and how can I like work on my own emotions and my own reactions to things and how I set boundaries and how I communicate and realizing that that is the biggest step forward to improving the rest of your life like no one else in your life has to change it's really working on yourself that matters like what you said with like the moms not following the plan the grandma's not following the plan we don't need grandma to follow the plan we just need to work on ourselves and eventually the people around us will see the change and they will be inspired to work on themselves as well and so I think that's really powerful I agree and I'm curious your thoughts on I think it is it is about not feeling alone but some of the rut I sometimes see is I'll be at lunch with a group of gals and no one feels alone because everyone is complaining yeah. about their overwhelm. Mm-hmm. And so I think the step beyond that is, okay, fine, we can all complain about it, but then what are you doing? For the mom who feels like, yes, my friend group, we all feel seen. We feel validated in our complaining, but they feel stuck. And so I think the biggest hurdle some people face is that next step. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious your thoughts on that. Is it like you have a community, but is it you got to find new friends? Is it you need to just really focus on you and take some space for yourself? I'm kind of curious your thoughts on that because I feel like a lot of, of women I know are stuck in that rut. There's a lot of complaining and then not a lot of adjusting. So you bring up a really good point because uh, first of all, let's address the complaining. There is uh, many ways to feel seen and feel not alone. Um, And when I talk about feeling not alone, it's not the um, constant complaining. There's really three types of problem solving when you're talking with friends. There's the venting, which is like one scenario where you're like, oh my gosh, yesterday I was doing this podcast interview and my dog started barking during the interview. Like that would be the venting that is actually very psychologically healthy to do and is really great to hear among friends you're like oh I've been there totally then there is the talking with a solution issue where that's kind of the place we are in our community and balance we vent and then we're like okay where could we move forward but Some people aren't in the mental space to do that. And if you try to do that, they're going to push back against you um, because they're not there for that. They're actually stuck in the third type, which is rumination. 
And a lot of mom groups today are stuck in this rumination trap where it is the same problem over and over and over again. Maybe it's a different day. Maybe it's a slightly different scenario, but underlying it is the same issue. And that is where we get stuck. So when we seek to change this and we're, we're around people who do this, it is really easy for us to get in the rumination trap too, where we don't take action on our lives, where we'll see the same thing like Groundhog Day coming up over and over again. So the first step is really to not ditch your friends, but to go and seek out other friend groups, other communities where you are exposed to the type of conversations that really, yes, make you feel seen, but also give you that additional step being like, okay, what could we do now? Or what am I working on now to try to make this better for both myself and my family? And once you see other people doing it, like I'm a strong believer, you have to see it to be it. Once you see other people doing it, you'll be like, oh, well, this could be my new norm. And this like over here, this doesn't have to be me. Um, and so when you have that thought process, you might go into that friend group and being like, hey, guys, like all of this is really getting me down. Could we like focus on something positive? Um, whereas before, if you hadn't seen that other conversation, you would have never brought that up because you're right. like, oh, this is just how it is. So I think that, you know, the step is to go out and find those people who are focused on growth rather than just the ruminating and complaining. And then that really changes yourself to advocate more for what you need. And this is where I actually think social media can be helpful or inspiring because I have really done social media cleansing where I just kind of unfollow things that make me feel less inspired or feel bad, guilty about it because someone is, you know, doing something I could not accomplish. But I do feel inspired when I see moms doing things for themselves or focusing on a hobby or showing the different aspects of their lives that's not all about parenting or and they have balance between work and family and taking care of themselves and so i do find in that sense social media can be really inspiring to moms out there for sure oh yeah definitely uh just finding those right accounts who don't make you feel horrible and who are uplifting and like give you something to go on. And I love that you say that like seeing moms live like outside lives away from their kids is really inspiring because I have to say, I love that as well. Like seeing the moms who travel without their kids or seeing the moms like pursue like personal accomplishments is huge because you do have to see it to be it. And if we don't see those representations of what motherhood can be, then we don't think it's achievable. Yeah. And I think in that regard, becoming a mom, what it looks like to take care of yourself or have your own hobby or interests can change. So before becoming a mom and all through my childhood, I rode horses and that was my love and my passion. It takes up a ton of time and it costs a ton of money. And I got back into riding after I had my kids and I give myself a lot of credit for that because I just dove right back in. It was one of those things I decided I was going to do and I got back into it. And I do think it helped a lot with my mental health. But then I started to have this business of sleep coaching and it kind of became my hobby, my fun project. And I put riding on hold and and kind of haven't gotten back into it, frankly. But then the business took off and then it suddenly felt like, okay, well, now that's my job. And I went a couple years where I felt like I had nothing for myself. Mm -hmm. And when I turned 40, I decided to pick up tennis. And it's been awesome. Of course, I did have a bad injury this past summer, but oh. I have made a comeback. Um, but it's been really great. But I've been really surprised by how many moms say to me, well, I couldn't do that. I can't find the time for that or I don't know how you find the time to work and play tennis and take care of the kids and there's certainly a whole cohort of moms I play tennis with and we have the greatest time and I want to tell all the other moms it doesn't have to be tennis but it better be something yeah you better have something 
that you can work on because it has made me so happy over the last two and a half years to have this hobby and something to work on. And I'm curious your thoughts and and where do you think having a hobby plays into having less mom guilt or having more mom guilt? I think that it's vitally important to have something outside of yourself and outside of your family that you do just for you. Uh, Eve Rodsky, who wrote the book Fair Play, likes to call it unicorn time. It's that thing that makes you interesting and gives you something else to talk about rather than your kids or your work life. And I've seen this play out in real time with my sister-in-law, Melissa. Uh, She was a teacher as well, and then she became a stay-at-home mom. Um, And she was just struggling at home. Like, it was not for her. And at first, she is really into plants. So she started this plant business from home where she would go to, like, the different grocery stores, find the rare stuff that, like, the grocery stores didn't even know like they had this great thing and then um sell them online and she became so good at this that the business took off and she was here spending all of her time trying to fulfill orders of plants and like pickups coming to her house that she had nothing for herself anymore it was her kids and the plant business So she decided to step away from the plant business for a little bit just to give herself some perspective. And she started experimenting. And I think that that is so vitally important. Just thinking like, what would I possibly be interested in? What could I do? And as she was talking to a friend, she found this improv group. And it was different than other improv classes, whereas a lot of improv classes are kind of male dominated and they tend to be on the dirty side of things. Like (laughs) there's a lot of like genitalia references, that sort of stuff that like I don't I'm not appealing to like that comedy is not appealing to me, nor was it appealing to her. But this one was completely clean and family friendly. And so she went and she joined this group and she loves it she's in an improv team now with women who are younger than she is who aren't necessarily moms but it's this big broadening of her perspective of what is fun and what is joyous and now she's like bringing everybody else in like i'm gonna go to a trial class in this group when it happens in january to try it out And I think that's the power of finding something outside of yourself. If you think about it in a long term, yes, it makes you happy in the long run, but you are also going to be inspiring all the women around you to be like, whoa, if she's doing this thing, I'm going to do this thing as well. So you are like doing so much good just taking that little bit of time and experimenting and finding something you find fun. I love that. And I would say the one area before we had this conversation, I was thinking about how tennis has been such a positive for me and my happiness. And then I was thinking, well, sometimes I do have that guilt try to creep in because my kids will put a little bit of a guilt trip on me. They do it all the time to me. All the time. Yes. Tell me about yours. Yes. So they (laughs) will say... You're going to another tennis match. Mm-hmm. You're you're playing tennis again. And I have to laugh because my kids have a double standard totally against my husband and I because he could literally, he also plays tennis. He's been a lifelong tennis player. He could literally go play tennis two nights in a row. And I could have not played tennis for a week. And I'll say, I'm going to a tennis match. And they'll say, again? But they would never say that to him. And it's like, guys, this is such a double standard. You do not give dad a hard time when he goes to play tennis. And so the way I have overcome that of not getting in the car and feeling like, oh, my gosh, the kids are really upset that I'm not there for dinner tonight and I'm not there to put them to bed is I have two daughters and I remind myself that I think it'll be great if they want to become mothers. That's great. But I am not just raising my daughters to be mothers. And I really hope that they have a life when they're older, that they, if they want to pursue a career, they pursue a career. If they want to be a stay-at-home mom, they're a stay-at-home mom, but they pursue a hobby. And so I always try to remind myself, I am leading by example, particularly for my daughters. And I guess if I had sons, I would say I'm also leading by example because I want them to have a wife who they would not think it's weird 
if she had hobbies. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And with the kids, like I go through the exact same thing with my kids and I have a daughter and a son. My daughter's 14, 15 actually on Saturday, and my son is 10. And usually like they're used to dad being away because we like as moms, like you're probably in the same situation I am, work from home. We're here all the time and they've just learned to depend on us like if it was switched and my husband was home all the time they would have learned to depend on him um so it's really not so much the part of like moms being like given the guilt all the time it's just the situations that we're in right now and what our kids are used to and if we looked at that we can kind of separate ourselves from the guilt and the second point is that the things we do to make us happy like you said it's so important to set an example that you need to take time for yourself and one of the things i love to do is i love to travel I will sign up for conferences like we the when we met at so I can travel so I can go out of the house and so I can leave and it makes me so happy my son was giving me such a hard time before trips they both do why do you have to go I don't want you to go like all leading up to leaving don't go even crying and like tears and you just feel completely awful and horrible um, and I was repeating to him okay you know this is gonna be makes me happy it's where I have fun well in October my uh, father-in-law his grandpa invited my son on a trip with him like to Vegas my son was over the moon to go he's like oh my gosh we're gonna fly on this plane and we're gonna go and I'm like yeah like and I told him and without any guilt associated I am gonna miss you but I realize how important this is for you to go and be happy and you're gonna come back and it's going to be wonderful and I, he took that in and he's like oh yeah I'm gonna come back I'm gonna it's gonna be good and then I'm gonna have fun and he went and he had fun and he came back and so a lot of it is our kids will only do so much of what we tell them us telling them it it's not so much for them we're never gonna convince them it's more for us just setting the boundaries and leaving anyways our kids learn more from their own experience so when experiences pop up for them it's also us giving them the same response that we really want from them oh I'm gonna miss you but you're gonna have so much fun and that is how they're going to learn that hey like leaving your family isn't quote unquote leaving your family it's going and doing something for you and you'll always come back happier and a calmer better person for it that is a such a good tip I think I probably need to be more thoughtful about how I treat my kids when they're off doing things I was really intentional about uh, how I handled them going to summer camp for the first time uh, because I did get a little guilt of, are you not going to miss me? <laughs> oh, and yeah. They set me up for it. So I was like, no, of course I'll miss you. But this is going to be a life-changing experience. You're going to have so much fun and I'll get you back. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I do, as you're talking, I was thinking, oh, sometimes I, I probably act annoyed. But in part because it involves me having to cart someone somewhere, or pick them up or get somewhere. And, and I think I might think about reframing how I treat them going away because I think that's a really good point about leading by example with how we want to have our kids view us leaving and coming back with a little bit of how we treat them with some of their things. And I have to say, like, my first inclination was to tell him, being like, oh, I'm so going to miss you. And why do you have to go? Like, that was the first thing that popped into my head. That is what I wanted to say. And um, I, I'm not perfect with the frustration or anything either. Like, you say, like, you act annoyed. when I mean, I do it, too. There is, like the huff where I'm like, fine. And my son is actually very sensitive and will call me out immediately. And he'll be like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like, wait, what happened? Like, what, what did I do? What? And then you realize that, oh, these reactions are ingrained within us and we do it without even thinking about it. Um, so just know, like, none of us is perfect. And those reactions we have are totally normal. But also like, the only way we catch ourselves in the moment is if we go back to situations like we weren't pleased with how we acted and we're like, okay, well, 
what was behind that? What triggered me in that? What was I thinking? And when we go back and reflect, our brains are more likely to be like, oh, I can change this right now. Like me catching myself. Oh, I could change this right now. And it's a process. So I know a lot of women give themselves shame for not reacting appropriately or yelling at their kids and just know it's a process. It's a process. Like all things. Like all things. Yes. <laughs> all right. So before we wrap up, we've talked about the importance of finding community and finding folks who help you feel motivated to make time for yourself and make change where change would be beneficial. We've talked a little bit about having hobbies and, and being okay with that and finding time for yourself. Do you have any other tip as it relates to kind of your household and just a quick takeaway where someone might feel a quick win from a little change? So in terms of your household, it really depends on communication in your household um, and what other people are expected to do. If we're talking about the household mental load, I will tell you that the biggest mistake that parents make when it comes to chores is not sitting down with their kids or not sitting down with their partner and discussing exactly which chores belong to which people and at what time are those chores expected to be done. Because we have those responsibilities at work, like we have deadlines at work, but if we don't have the same thing at home, then we don't know when it's appropriate to follow up. And we also think that like all the things undone are then our responsibility, but they're not, they just haven't been assigned to a particular person. So I think that's the biggest thing that you can take away when it comes to household tasks. Uh, that's a good one because I was really good about this over the summer. My mission became to teach my kids how to fold their laundry and put it away. And over the summer, it was before uh, you can watch any show or play with any friends or do anything. After swim practice, the laundry, your personal laundry has to be folded. And then when the school year started, which of course now we're about to hit Christmas break, but I have completely failed at reassigning when this laundry is going to be done because now they go to school in the morning and I find myself feeling so annoyed come the weekend. I'm like, oh my gosh, all of their laundry is unfolded. And so this weekend they had to have a folding marathon, but I realized I've just never really reassigned. Well, when do I expect them to fold the laundry? And so without giving them any guidance, they're just not no longer folding their laundry. Yeah, and you, like you might be shocked actually with my example of laundry, but like there are tasks in my house which I view as, you know, they're personal tasks and there's family tasks. A family task is something like the dishes. We all eat. If I cook the meals, I am not expected to then clean. Like we all have to work as together as a family. And them not doing their dishes job affects the rest of the family. And then there's personal stuff. And the personal stuff I think is like keeping your room clean and um, keeping your laundry folded. Those are things like I really let natural consequences take hold. And it's a really, really hard thing for many parents in my community because you will go past your kid's room and you'll see it completely messy and you'll be like, oh my gosh, like they're not gonna be able to find anything. Like I would go completely crazy in that environment and you would go completely crazy in that environment. But they have not yet made the connection that they will go completely crazy in that environment. So what we've done with both of our kids is we let them decide when they clean their rooms. We also let them decide when what to do with their laundry. Like in my house, we all take care of our own laundry. My husband does his own laundry. I do my own laundry. My kids do their own laundry. Um, and they get to decide when to fold it. My daughter now folds all of her laundry right away, watching a YouTube video. Her room's completely clean. It wasn't that way all the time. She used to have the messiest bedroom ever. My son is now in the messy bedroom stage and he's coming out of that because we've had some instances where he couldn't find things because it was such a messy bedroom and he had to then solve it. And I went in and solved it with him. Like I was like, okay, well, let's, let's pick this up a little bit. Let's clean this up. Let's get you started with a blank slate and let's try this again. And I've noticed once he went through that pain and when I helped him get to that blank slate again, he's kept it clean. 
Like I haven't gone in and done anything to his room because he experienced the natural consequence of not being able to find anything. Um, we also had a very old senior cat who was using his room as a litter box, which oh, also, no. it was gross. It was real gross, but it was also what happens when you leave all your stuff on the ground. <laughs> like it's what happens. And I could not teach him that better than my poor old senior cat could like he was really the best teacher of that one and so he now the laundry and this is actually when I met my husband too my husband was like well I know it's time to do laundry when I can't tell the dirty pile from the clean pile and that's kind of the way my son is dealing with laundry right now and that's okay I don't need to focus on that one I have enough to focus on so those personal chores I let them handle and we focus on what affects the family and that helps me in my mental load a lot so interesting so you would say your daughter who I think you said is 15 right she's she's gonna be 15 this Saturday yeah at what age because my girls are nine and ten one's gonna be 11 soon did she start to pivot because my fear would be if I just my younger one would actually clean up she's a little more tidy my older daughter I think she could go knee high and laundry in there. She'd let that room completely fall apart, probably. That's that was my son. That's my son. Okay. I mean, my son is now going through the pivot right now, um, where he is beginning to look a lot closer at his personal appearance, and he is bathing regularly. Yes, yes. Score. And um, it's nothing to do with me. Like, I really have taken myself out of the picture. Now, do I go up to him and I'm like, dude, you're, you're a little smelly. You need to take a shower. Yes, of course I do that because I'm just giving him the heads up. But am I on him every night being like, oh, it's shower time. Oh, it's shower time. I don't do that. I'm more in like, I need to bring him aware to the natural consequences that are occurring right now. Not the ones that occur like in the future or are potential that are happening right now that he could see and be like, oh, okay, I see that. I see that. Um, So he started it. My daughter was around the same age. It's all about that transition into puberty where they really start being more concerned with their personal appearance, but they won't do it if they feel that someone else is making them do it. It has to be a personal thing where as an adult, you're just there to support them. You're there to be like, if they're like, yeah, I'm smelly. You're like, oh, okay, I can get you some deodorant. That's cool. Yeah, let's do that. Versus the, you need to do this, this, and this, and this. I think kids really rebel against that because that is their personal autonomy being taken away and their self-motivation. So we work against ourselves as parents sometimes. (laughs) It's interesting you say that because my almost 11-year-old recently had said, I think I'm ready to redo my room. And can you help me clean it up? And I said, sure, because she had a very disorganized desk that I was and dresser that I was not micromanaging. And uh, I said, sure, we can do that. And then something had come up that weekend. And I said, I can't help you with that right now. I have to do something else. But why don't you start with the desk and just focus on getting that organized? And when I went in that night, I said, wow, your desk looks amazing. I, I kind of thought when I saw it, oh, I'm surprised she was able to pull this off. And she said, yeah, I know. I paid my Ainsley, my little sister. I paid my Ainsley to do it. That is resourcefulness <laughs> right there. I mean, like, <laughs> you got to be you got to be a little bit proud as an entrepreneur and knowing like delegation. Yes. <laughs> she kept she said, "Mom, this is how the marketplace works. I have it's allowance true. money and I get to decide if I want to put my money back out into the marketplace, which I did because I don't like to clean and Ainsley's a yeah. great organizer. So I put my money back out in the marketplace and then she she got to take money and she got to put her skills to use. And I thought, genius. It is genius. Oh my gosh. My daughter actually pays my son to find lost things in her room for her. Like if she loses an earring and she's lost, like looked everywhere, she's like, I'll pay you five bucks. He's like, sold. And he'll go like look at his room and, and find it for her. So it's really interesting. It's the power of giving kids allowance as well. Letting them choose what they want to do with their own money. Like you find some really funny things happen. Right. Well, that's mm-hmm. interesting. Maybe I'll change my approach to uh, laundry and see how they shake out. One thing I did start saying was with the folding, the laundry, I kept noticing they were putting 
some stuff that I thought this was clean. And I think sometimes she would take stuff out to try it on, decide she didn't want to wear it and throw it in the laundry basket. Mm -hmm. And so once I made them fold their own laundry, that came to an abrupt end. And I was like, wow, I should have really thrown that over their way much sooner because (laughs) I've been wasting my energy on extra laundry I didn't need to do. Are they doing their own, like, are they putting it in the washer and the dryer and stuff? Too, they are or not, are but my kids are very petite. I guess I could bring in a stool. We have a small laundry room and they're very petite. And so they couldn't even get up to do it unless I really overcrowded my laundry room. But they could find a way. They probably could. My son, like, he likes to be the joker. And so he'll be, like, calling me from the laundry room. Mom! Mom! And I'll come in, and he will be face down in the washer with his feet sticking up right? over the edge. He's like, Mom! Can you? And he's doing it to be funny. But, I mean, he also is not tall enough yet Yeah, for that's the, the stage my um, kids are in. It's like, they find a way. They, I don't know. We'll have to experiment with that. But I like the idea of handing over. My husband also does his own laundry, and I do mine. I never took on his laundry, which is like one of the smartest things I did um, because it's his laundry. He can do his own laundry. Yeah, Uh, exactly. But I have been in charge of the kids' laundry, so I might have to – it's about time to start punting that. It is. And you know what? Your husband will probably be on board too. In fact, like if you – sometimes like I give my husband jobs like that I am too – I let myself get in the way. Like my my son has not – knew how to bike – but was really scared about biking to school. And I'm the one who sees him off in the morning. And so it was never happening. Um, But when actually we were at, I think it was maybe the podcast movement conference we met at, or maybe it was the next conference I went to, all of a sudden I get a picture in the morning with my son waving goodbye to my husband on his bike going to school because my husband didn't have the hangups about it. And that's okay. It doesn't mean I need to release my hangups. It's just like your daughter learning how the marketplace works. Some things like you can give it to your husband. They don't have the hangups and that job will get done. Oh It'll yeah. Be off your this plate. is true with some sleep stuff too. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we just got to hand it mm-hmm. over to the parent yeah. who's less stressed about the whole situation and let them reset things. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, good strategy. Well, Joanne, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for your time. For people who are new to you, tell them how they can find you. You can come listen to us as the No Guilt Mom podcast. Uh, Every Tuesday and Thursday, we have a new episode. So come on over there. And then um, we're at noguiltmom.com as well. Perfect. Well, we will link to that in the show notes. And thanks again for joining me. And thanks for the work that you do supporting moms. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to How Long Till Bedtime. To learn how we can work together to improve your child's sleep, please visit sleepandwellnesscoach.com.